Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Barbroians, a podcast series exploring the cinematic career, at least for the moment, of the Barbarian Brothers. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is my fellow butt sniffer, J.D. DeMott. <laughs> thank you, thank you, um, I think. And we are being joined by a very special chowderhead. <laughs> Everyone, please welcome Evie. <laughs> Yay! This movie had so many fun insults in it. <laughs> Amazing! Uh... We are here to discuss the fourth and final film starring the Barbarian Brothers. Oh. It's a sad day. Yeah. It's a very sad day. It is. I mean, we still got one more kind of odds and ends episode planned, but yeah, this is the end of what was a surprisingly delightful journey. Yeah, yeah. I was not expecting to enjoy this as much as I did. I expected to have fun talking with you about some cheesy bad movies, but I actually have enjoyed all of these to one degree or another. I expected a lot of delightful mocking, but who would know that the true delight was all the hormones we took along the way? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I say that with love. It's been a journey, and this brings us to the final leg of the journey as we watch the 1994 film Twin Sitters. Is this a film any of us had ever seen before? No. I had seen Alison Pregler's review of it oh, yeah. on YouTube. Oh, yeah, that. I would have seen that. But I had never actually sat through the whole movie until yesterday. This is one that I've heard about for years. I actually tried watching it once, I'll say like a year or two ago. I didn't make it past the opening restaurant sequence. But yeah, it's been a very interesting journey of discovery going through all these. <laughs> so Evie, as kind of a returning guest, do you have any thoughts in saying farewell to the Barbarian Brothers with one more movie? I'm very sad. I didn't expect to be. I'm very sad. I know. It feels like there should be 20 of them out there, doesn't it? Right? Like, there's some people where I'm like, you go into someone's filmography and I'm like, how do they have so many movies? And then this, I'm like, how do we not have more? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Getting into production notes, this is one of only two movies that were produced by this one company. Are you at all familiar with Golan and Globus? I am. In passing, I've heard of the name, but not very in-depth. They were the Israeli producers who created Canon Films. Oh, okay. Canon was this bizarro studio in the 80s that just made all kinds of exploitation schlock, then somehow rose up to the level of actually making Oscar-worthy pictures that they paid for with all of the schlock. And then they kind of folded, they parted ways. Globus actually went and became the president of MGM briefly, and then when he broke off, he created this one production studio that produced this and Street Night, a 1993 direct-to-video action movie starring Jeff Speakman. <laughs> Who, again, why does he have more movies than the Barbarian Brothers? If you want to see any fun history on Canon Films and Golan and Globus, absolutely watch the film. I believe it's still on Netflix, Electric Boogaloo, the story of Canon Films, because it is yeah. one of the most bizarre Hollywood stories ever told. And it, it is just so tastelessly whimsical. That's a great documentary. And it's just bizarre, the type of films that they were making back in the day. This is, again, written and directed by John Paragon. We got into him on the Double Trouble episode. He was the director of that. Again, John B. the Genie. He was one of the major writers and directors for both Elvira and Pee Wee Herman. That's pretty much all I have for production notes, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do not have a prepared synopsis, but I think I should be able to wing it. You can do it. I believe in you. I believe, well, I believe that you can probably try. Yeah. Frank Hillhurst is the CEO of a trucking company. He's been doing a under-the-table deal with Leland Strom, who is using the trucks to dump toxic waste into the L.A. sewer system. And this has led to a number of deaths, a significant amount of pollution, 
And when Frank decides to go to the feds, he becomes a target of various hitmen. Now, while he's being attacked, he notices a bunch of people at a park being rescued by Peter and David Falcone, played by the Barbarian Brothers, are a pair of hapless lunks who are working odd jobs here and there that they keep getting fired from in the hopes that they can one day secure a loan so that they can start their own restaurant, because one of them is a great chef and the other is a charmer who could work as a maitre d'. Frank decides to hire the Falcones to protect his two nephews, and his two nephews are identical twins. What ensues is about a straight hour of twins versus twins, shenanigans and booby traps and pranks and things going wildly over the top and crossing many lines that many children's films are not allowed to cross while hitmen are trying to kill everybody. And this all leads up to a gigantic finale where our hero twins have to save the child twins from a boat that's about to blow up. So JD, do you recommend Twin Sitters? I do. It is an enjoyable romp. I don't think John Paragon is a great director, but I still enjoy the Barbarian Brothers so much. Their charm comes through in every scene that they're in, even when they're doing horrible things that really shouldn't be doing to kids. But I'm just immediately charmed by them every time they're on screen. And yeah, there's a lot of fun bits in this film. I mean, it is definitely over the top and silly, but I had a lot of fun. Evie, do you recommend Twin Sitters? Yes, it's so sweet. It's not good as the other one, I will say that. But there's a sweetness and this idea of family. <laughs> Don't laugh. How dare you? Say but yeah, no, it's funny. <laughs> hey, JD, do you have a permit to sell hot dogs? Because your fly is open. <laughs> <laughs> is that not how you check with your family to make sure that they're asleep? That's a hundred percent how I do that. <laughs> you know, more children's films need to tell people, "Hey, check your penis." Right. <laughs> I feel like we would live in a better world if more movies did that in yes. general. Yes. The one thing that I'd really, really like that I shouldn't, but I do, is the slapstick. The like three stooges level of slapstick and the reactions and the sound effects that go with it. And I should hate it, but I love it. It's so fun. Honestly, the worst part for me are the sound effects in this movie <gasps> and the 90s direct-to-video kids movie synth score. Yeah. It's very synth trumpety, but oh, do I recommend it. I think it takes a little while to find its footing. Once you get the twins versus twins, it starts to really take off and settle into a lot of fun shtick. I love how all the side characters are built into the... It's really obvious, silly shtick humor, but I kind of liked how committed it is to just letting all these characters go so over the top as far as they do. I love how much it fully embraces the Barbarian Brothers. I should also mention, this is the first film where the two Barbarian Brothers are also producers, so they had some creative control. I mean, to the point where they are literally doing their own wardrobe. That's how they dressed. That is literally how they would dress every day. Life. I can believe it. I will say this film is wrong. It is so wrong as a kid's movie. We have straight up people getting murdered, children attempting to murder people, a lot of definitely wrong violence, but it's wrong in the way that kids would love. And it's wrong in the way that kids would hide from their parents and enjoy. So I... I I can't hold it against it because if I were like a 10 year old watching this film, I would absolutely not let my mom know I'm watching it, but I would love it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. This is the type of movie as a kid I probably would have really enjoyed. Yeah, it's kind of like Double Trouble in that it's hitting that weird thing of there's a lot of adult humor in it, even though it feels like it's aimed at eight year olds. Yeah, I got that same impression too. There's a lot of weird stuff that like the jokes with the maid, for example. <laughs> But even then, I love how it's like when she's trying to expose more cleavage, they put like this big cartoony boing sound effect as she's popping out her boobs. Yeah. Or even just the way that she's running and screaming after she's caught having sex with the gardener. <laughs> it's played so silly. I wouldn't have gotten it entirely as a kid, but it's like once I get older, I'm like, oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially when like the two brothers go crashing through the window and she's like, oh, that's so hot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a weird balance. And like some of the stuff that goes on, especially like when it opens up, is really kind of dark. Like the guy drowns in a toxic waste or something. Yeah, yeah. Evie, what did you think about the interesting tones of this movie? I mean, if I had kids, I would let my kids watch this, so. I would too. We'd be amazing parents. Yes. Actually, my parents might have watched it with me because they had like weird ideas as to what was okay for me to watch and what wasn't. I would watch this with a kid before I would watch Monster Squad with a kid. Fair point. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Monster Squad, I just don't want kids picking up on all the gay bashing and just start repeating that. Mm. There's no behavior in this that the kids could actually physically do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Unless it's like, hey, I'm going to pretend to commit suicide. That would be the only part that would be questionable. Everything else would be fine. Yeah, yeah. Throwing an electric heater into a pool is perfectly okay. It's a weird movie because, okay, so you have the Barbarian Brothers and you have the kids, and they're basically at war for a good chunk of the movie. It's questionable some of the tactics that the Barbarian Brothers use in terms of, like, tying the kids to chairs, pouring spaghetti on their heads, wrapping them up in their blankets and dragging them down the stairs. But when you think about the fact that these are kids who pretended to hang themselves for a laugh or who attempted to murder these men by throwing a gigantic electric heater into a pool that they were floating in. At least the one kid is really a terrible sociopath. Yeah. I don't even know what you guys are talking about because that cord was too short, so it's fine. Here's the question. Do you think the kids knew that was going to happen or do you think they genuinely intended to electrocute the Barbarian Brothers? To be fair, I believe this is a film universe where the Barbarian Brothers would have survived it. They would have just been covered in soot and smoke and like have their hair on ends, you know? Yeah. I could believe that. Like, this is a cartoon universe just with live action people. Though it's also a cartoon universe where we are literally seeing like a guy stumble into a pool with a knife in his back, people getting their necks snapped, people throwing off of cliffs. <laughs> you know, for kids. Yeah. Oh, kids are fine. It's one of those things where it's like the behavior is inappropriate, but I feel it's a give and take scenario. It's a tit for tat type thing. I believe the response is appropriate given what the kids are doing. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, as bad as the Barbarian Brothers may act around the kids, the kids are way worse, especially Bradley. Like, he is going down a dark path if it weren't for the Barbarian Brothers to reach out and, like, save him. So it's really a heroic story in the end. <laughs> And then I kind of like that even you have the bit where they finally break through to the kids. Brad is still being an ass where Steven finally separates from Brad and tells him, it's like, I'm sick and tired of following your lead and doing everything you say to do. I don't even like all the foods you force me to eat and all that stuff. And they just start duking it out on the lawn. And the Barbarian Brothers just like, ah, just let them work it out. Cut to next day in the classroom as the two brothers are sitting there with black eyes and the teacher's like suspicious. And rightfully so. We fell. Yeah. <laughs> And then I love the two Barbarian Brothers for no reason just have this gigantic fight tearing through the entire house and the two brothers are like, eh, just let them work it out. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's like the stupidest humor in this movie and yet I think there's just such a commitment to just embracing how silly it is. It's weird because it does go for that dark tone at times, but for the most part it seems to be completely aware that it, like, okay, it's a cartoon universe mm -hmm. and it embraces it. It's just a weird balance, and I think the best part of it is that second act when it is just the kids versus the adult twins. When it becomes the action film at the end, it's like, okay, that's fine. And the beginning part is getting you to the point where you're really getting to enjoy it, but that yeah. middle part is the best. I even do love the bit in the third act, though, where the henchman has the two kids tied up and they're screaming for help, and it's like, you guys have been screaming for hours. I've told you, no one can hear you. And they're like, yeah, but you can. <laughs> 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 yeah, I like that too. Just annoy your yeah. guard just because you can. Evie, what were some of your favorite bits? I'm trying to think. I'm like, all of them? <laughs> I really liked where they were trying to throw the heater into the pool. It was just funny. <laughs> That's going far. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm like, ah, it's funny. Oh, God, I'm a monster. I love the whole recurring joke. Every time they go to the dinner table, they find something new to glue to the Barbarian Brothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even when like David gets so angry, he just like picks up the entire table. <laughs> <laughs> Which I wish I could do. That looks like an amazing skill to have. You could put that on your resume. So, Evie, what did you think of the Barbarian Brothers wardrobe in this movie? It's so amazing that you can't look at it, but you can't look away from it. <laughs> it's poetry and just, I can't, word. It's so beautiful. I love the jacket that's accessorized with troll dolls. I You saw that too? That was <laughs> yes. the best. No, 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 no. The best is the hat with the birds nesting on it <laughs> because it's really just an analogy for the film. It's about people finding a home and nesting and accepting children into their lives. I'm touched by the beauty of the statement here. I'm sorry. I'm going to need a minute. I love that they have Viking horns. They have a propeller beanie. <laughs> I love that for no reason, one of them is literally wearing a sign around his neck, but it's such a long chain that it's dangling all the way down to his feet. It's not a chain. It's a phone cord. It's one it's of those curly yeah. old school curly phone cords, which was amazing. It is like the best. Just put everything you find in a thrift store in a blender and just see what comes out. I love that the maid is like, I sewed the hole in your jeans, and they are jeans literally stitched together from like three different pants. 
And I love that they'll have handkerchiefs just flowing out of every pocket. I love when they have the big poofy pirate shirts. I love when they have the shirts that the collar is so wide open, it is literally hanging down on their elbows and is exposing their entire upper chest. It's weird, but it's beautiful. It's weird, it's beautiful, and it is exactly what the... I mean, honestly, Peter Paul still dresses like that to this day. Yeah, I can believe that. Good. David Paul is a little more just kind of loose shirts and jeans now, but Peter Paul, that's still his thing. Good, because it's an amazing (laughs) sense of fashion. Look, you go look at some of the runway shows, and I'm like, yeah, no, that's not very different, actually. Yeah. Uh, the, God, who was the one who did, the guy with the white hair and the ponytail who has the adorable dog? He did a Chanel show that was People of Walmart, and I'm just like, it's essentially the same thing. He ripped off the Barbarian Brothers, except he used less color, Aww. which is disappointing. <laughs> you gotta have the color. Right? Yeah, the color, it makes it like the most 90s film of all time. You look at their outfits and like, yeah, none of us actually dress like that, but we all wished we dressed like that. Oh, God, yeah. I don't say this as a joke. I am genuinely bummed that we never got to have them in another Joel Schumacher movie where you just got to see his take on that fashion aesthetic. Yeah. God, they would have been amazing Batman villains. They would have been great popping up as henchmen in the Batman movie. They could have been Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Ooh. Maybe as henchmen for like a major villain, but still, that would have been better than Bane. Well, if they made them like Bane and Killer Croc as a tag team. <gasps> Ooh, I like that too. Or, or God, imagine a Joel Schumacher Batman doing the baby doll story oh. where they're her two baby brothers. <laughs> I can totally see that. Get like late 90s, eight-year-old Dakota Fanning as Baby Doll, because she could have pulled off that performance. I didn't mean to. And then those two as like her baby brothers with like giant lollipops and propeller beanies and that kind of thing. So basically just the regular outfits based on what you've told us. (laughs) Yes. Oh, man. Oh, I want that movie. Right? So anyways... John Paragon, I don't think he is a great director, but I think he's good at the right stuff. I think the problem with Double Trouble and this are it's trying to juggle a few too many different tones. I think this one's more successful than Double Trouble because Double Trouble was trying to be a little bit more of an actual gritty action movie, which I don't think his strengths lie. Yeah. This one is more you get a couple little actiony moments, but it's mostly just shtick comedy. It's a kid's film with things that are designed to fly over the kids' heads, yeah. but it's aimed at appealing to kids. And I think that it's mostly successful there. I think if I had watched this film when it came out, I probably would have loved it. What's a dangling participle? <laughs> Is that what you have when you run out of toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> So, Evie, among, like, all the various oddball supporting cast members, who was your favorite? Like, the random little character that I like. It's, like, one visual gag, and it's awesome. The EPA lady who smokes. (laughs) Oh, I like that, too. They did so much in just a tiny little bit, and I'm like, I love it. I love everything about it. The EPA lady was not an actress. That was the caterer on set. (laughs) So it was obviously just this little last-minute joke that they threw in. Okay, well, she looks like she could fight me, so. Yeah. The FBI guy? The nerdy bespectacle guy? Yeah, the one who's like just so bumbling and everything and then like completely shoots a guy at the end. And I was like, yes. Completely saves the day, yeah. Yeah. I was like, you're awesome. I love it. And all of the twins. I think that's one of the things that I think John Paragon is great at. And I know this probably comes from his sketch humor background. He's great at really working with the actors to just crank all the characters up to 11 and kind of like bring them out as far as they can go. And finding odd little interest things like, yeah, the bumbling FBI agent who saves the day or even, hey, let's get Bill Moomy as a grinning, lovable hitman in the last movie, you know? He's got really great comedic instincts. Yeah. I think that comes from his performance I don't think he handles the serious aspects as well. No. But that's fine, because in this film, that's not the focus. That's not really the point. And even then, there's a few that do work, like whenever Frank is worried about the kids and you can see his genuine affection for him. Yeah. Though, to be honest, I didn't really connect with Frank. He was kind of just a MacGuffin. I think he tried. I did get a little bit in that one phone call that he has with the twins when they're, like, jumping in the pool and everything. Uncle Frank, I'm sorry for being a chowderhead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cute yeah but otherwise you don't really get a feel for him as a character Mm -hmm. yeah a little bit to the detriment of the movie i mean it's not really about him right so it's not like you feel like you're really missing out 
So anyway, so getting into all the other twins. So again, in the third act, the Barbarian Brothers infiltrate the boat where the kids have been kidnapped are being held, and they call in as backup the Tiger Twins and the Alim Twins. And the Tiger Twins are, of course, identical twin Asian martial artists in geese that have tigers on them, and every time they appear, it's Oriental music. Yeah. Which is pretty common for the time, but yeah. it doesn't age very well. No. The Kim brothers are an actual stunt team. They actually are in Batman and Robin as one of Mr. Freeze's recurring henchmen, but I don't know how much you actually see them. The Aleem twins. Evie, what did you think about the Aleem twins? Amazing. I want to see them in more things. I want to see them in everything. I agree. I thought the Tiger twins, they didn't really get a chance to do much other than just show off their martial arts skills. The Aleem twins, they were only on screen for like maybe like two minutes at most. But they had such great chemistry and charisma. Yeah. But the, yeah, it's like mm-hmm. they just shine. Oh, I'm the pretty one. Oh, I'm the pretty. Yeah. I want to see a movie where they team up with the Barbarian Brothers. Like that's the entire film. We need that prequel backstory. <laughs> exactly. I was interested the Aleem twins, and that's their actual name. They are not actors or fighters or anything. They are musicians who were part of Jimi Hendrix's band back in the 60s and 70s. Oh, wow. And I think they've since passed away, but they were still pretty prominent producers and musicians in the hip-hop community up till, I want to say, a decade ago. So this is kind of like one of their few big acting things. And then in the end of the movie, when the twins finally open up their restaurant, the waitresses are these three identical triplets. Those are the Del Rio sisters. The Del Rio sisters were a singing group from the 50s who then made a big comeback in the 80s as recurring performers on Pee Wee's Playhouse. I thought they looked familiar. That makes sense. And what's funny is you can actually find quite a few videos of them. They just do these really gaudy, adorable, acoustic covers of stuff like Whip It and Boots Were Made for Walking. And they even did a cover of Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit. I need to see this. And they're just so wonderful. But yeah, I love how they take the shtick of every time someone sees twins in a movie, they do that kind of gaping side to side look. I love that when the twins meet in this movie, all the twins do the same reaction to other twins. (laughs) They're having fun with that. You forgot the wives. Yes. The lean twins have wives that are also twins. I don't really know any backstory to those two. Yeah. Sidra and Tasha Smith, according to IMDb. It's a cute gag. I mean, just like, yeah. it's to inception. It's just every time you think, okay, we've seen the last of the new set of twins. No, no, there's more. Oh, now there's triplets. Okay. Well, and we know that this is a cartoon children's universe where through their relationship with the teacher, we already have a progressive portrayal of polyamory. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually really surprising. They're both going to date the teacher. It's an effective solution. Yeah. yeah. So Evie, what did you think of Rena Sofer as a teacher, Judy? I love her. But like, I loved her from like other stuff before this. I had a huge crush on her back in the 90s. I still do. (laughs) Same. I loved her. I thought she was really sweet. She doesn't get a lot to do, but she's so sweet. She's awesome. And she's so pretty. She is one of those actresses who she just pops up in so many things. She never really took off as a headlining star herself, but she just is always like any show you watch in the 90s, she's going to be in a few episodes. She's usually going to date someone for an episode, you know? (laughs) Yeah, usually. (laughs) I mean, I liked her. I thought she was really charming, and I thought she actually handled the aspect of dating the two brothers really well, as it could have been something that could have been really weird or implied as being really kinky or anything, and said it's just like, oh, okay, she just likes both of them. Yeah, and they play all the dating scenes as just very innocent, you know, holding hands, balloons and stuffed animals, pecks on the cheek type things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unlike the maid. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the actress. The only thing I've actually seen her in is Nathan Petrelli's wife in Heroes. Mm-hmm. She's primarily a soap opera actress. Like, I know she's still on Bold and Beautiful, but she's just one of those actresses who just had a very striking look and would just pop up. And again, like, she would be on an episode of pretty much every sitcom made in the 90s. Like, I know she was on Just Shoot Me. She was on Friends. She was on all these things, but she never really got anything where she was in a rather leader prominent role. But even in movies in the 90s, like, she would just pop up. This is actually probably one of her bigger roles, hmm. I hate to say. But yeah, no, she hasn't aged today. She still looks exactly the same. Again, it was very sweet. It was probably a little bit much where it's like they're going to break out into a giant fight and we'll only stop if she agrees to date both of them. That's not exactly the best wooing tactic. Yeah. Hey, Evie. What's up? What'd you think about the butler, Thomas? I hated him so much. 
And the thing is, I would have been fine. I would have been like, oh, put upon Butler. But as soon as I found out he was the bad guy, I'm like, every time a horrible thing happened to him, I was like, good, good. <laughs> More horrible things should happen to you. To the point, I was like, I, you'd think I'd feel bad, but no. When they were threatening to pull him apart with the truck, yes. I was just like, no, that's fair. That's 100% fair. That's where I was in the movie. I love the Xerox lie detector. <laughs> nope, he's still lying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed him as the, I don't want to say comic relief because the entire film. He's the butt monkey in the movie. Yeah, but he's the hacky sack of the, of the film that just gets kicked around for the entire movie. And yeah. I enjoyed him as that. I think it got to the point where I think they may have overplayed every single time he like is carrying something, he's going to get knocked down. How dare you, sir? It happens like <laughs> one or two times too many. It is such a recurring gag. It is literally every time he is in a scene, something drops and shatters. Pretty much. He runs into people. He reacts to things. <laughs> yeah. I get it. It's a recurring joke, but I think the rule of three is probably where they should have been aiming at, and I think they did uh, that a few more times than that. But other than that, I thought he was really good at playing that role of the put-upon butler. He just happens to be an evil put-upon butler. Well, and that's what I liked is by making him be an enemy agent on the inside is you don't feel bad for him. I feel bad for Frank because his assets are frozen, so he can't really pay to repair any of the damage that's being done <laughs> to his house throughout the entire movie. Evie, how do you think they did with the shattering gags? I like them. I mean, I like my slapstick a little too much, possibly. <laughs> I like the slapstick, but then on top of that, once I knew he was the bad guy, I was just like, oh, no, it's fine. This is completely fine. I was more hoping, like, I hope you're just picking up bits of glass out of, like, your shoulder or something after. Because I hated him by then. Right in that part of the back you can't reach. Exactly. By the way, did his voice sound familiar to any of you? Uh, mm, kind a of. A little bit, but he's got that British accent that's kind of... He was the voice of the Chamberlain, the lead Skeksy in Dark Crystal. Oh, okay. He's since passed away, but he was Barry Denon. Big theater actor, big character actor tons and tons of voice work through a lot of cartoons and video games throughout the 90s. Like, up to the last airbender, he was still doing voice work. JD, what did you think of Mother Love as Penny the Cook? She was funny. She feels almost like a very... It's the sassy black woman. Yeah, she's very trope-heavy, but she does that well. Like, I actually laugh quite a bit. Like, when she's throwing cans at the bad guys when they're trying to kidnap the kids, and she grabs, like, one, she's like, oh, I got the big one now, and it's like a giant industrial-sized can, and just, like, tosses it. I laughed at that. I wish she was given a little bit more to do. I think that's one thing I kind of wish this whole movie had fleshed out a little bit more of its side characters, just a tiny bit more. I just want to say that the commitment of the bad guys, that she's like hit them in the face with a frying pan. <laughs> and they're like, no, nah, keep going. If someone hit me with a frying pan, that would be my week. I'd be like, no, I'm going home. I'm not coming back. Remember the one where she puts the giant spaghetti pot over the guy's head and just starts banging on it? <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I love how far they let her go in terms of that is her kitchen and she is going to defend it. Mm -hmm. She's not just throwing like one or two cans. She is emptying that entire pantry on the sky. Yeah. <laughs> Which that looks like an amazing pantry. And I will say like one of my favorite scenes with her is when the brothers are fighting each other, mm -hmm. they start walking into the kitchen and she's like, uh-uh, not in my kitchen. And they just like- They hang their heads and mope out. Okay. And then they walk out and then immediately crash through another <laughs> door outside of the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. I was surprised. Getting back to the maid Lolita. Of course, that would be the maid's name. Yeah. Valentine Vargas. I was surprised. I've seen her in a rather prominent acting role. She was in one of the Hellraiser sequels as one of the lead Cenobites. If you've ever seen any of the Hellraiser sequels, she's Angelique. She was one of the Cenobites who joined in part four. Very famous design where the scalp on her head is split open and is being held down under her shoulders. And It was really interesting seeing her in such a different role. And then we never really got much from the gardener other than just he's very intense and I'm guessing is supposed to be a red herring. Yeah, I didn't feel like there might have been like scenes cut or something like that. And then he ends up with the maid, yeah. Like there's the one scene where he's just tearing like a shrub apart into little tiny pieces while the brothers are fighting. Is he getting off on that? What's going on? And it's like you can't even paint that as he's jealous about the maid because they're trying to get a date from the teacher in that scene, not the maid. Yeah. I felt like there was something that was missing there. I don't know if there was some scene connective tissue that got cut. I feel like John Paragon films are ones where they're just kind of making them up as they go along. Yeah, that's quite possible. And then on the villain side, so George Lazenby, Mr. One-Time Bond himself, is the bad guy. 
I don't think he left much of an impression, did either of you? I liked him as a bad guy. He felt like he was in a different movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he, he's playing it 100% serious. He just didn't have that fun that Roddy McDowell brought to the last one. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, definitely not. Yeah, I will agree with that 100%. I've not seen George Lazenby in very much other than in Her Majesty's Secret Service. Like, that was his first acting role. I really didn't like him as a James Bond. I just don't think he was experienced enough, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, but now he plays, oh, yeah, like, yeah. a smooth-talking bad guy. Like, he's just really in the wrong movie. Like, he would have been yeah. a great villain in, like, a Die Hard or a Lethal Weapon-type film of the 80s or 90s. Like, he would have been perfect in that. Mm-hmm. But he just feels like a really weird choice for, like, a kid's movie <laughs> where he's killing people and being not very funny. Yeah. He was also there. It felt like they had him on set for a day. Because there's really only three scenes that he's in. And they're all on the docks. Oh, yeah. You could actually be like, yeah, no, we only had him for an afternoon. That's all we could get. He's in the warehouse on the docks. He's outside the warehouse on the docks. And he's on the boat that's at the docks. So it feels like they filmed all of his stuff in like a night. (laughs) And you'll notice like in the climax, he's never on screen at the same time as the rest of the group. Just the teacher. Yeah. And Frank. (laughs) I don't think it's a bad role. I mean, it's better than some other, like, hey, Eric Roberts is on set for a day. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. (laughs) Or something like that. Yeah, I think he actually put effort into the role. It just, you know, there's nothing there. Yeah, I don't think they had enough time to build the character in any way. Right. And then his lead henchman, I don't know if he looks familiar to either of you, that was Nitro from American Gladiators. The one that's dressed up as a cop? Yeah, the actual hitman, hitman. Huh, cool. Danny Lee Clark, who, fascinating, martial artist, stuntman, did a bunch of acting, suffered a massive heart attack, and then still survived it and then wrote a book about it. And then has since been developing recovery training for people who have also suffered similar heart attacks in their middle age. That's cool. That's really cool. Well, and Mother Love, she's a survivor of diabetes who still to this day goes around and does like a lot of seminars about care management and stuff for diabetes treatment. A lot of interesting people in this. So Evie, what did you think about Chekhov's monster truck? (laughs) Oh, I was so happy. So happy. When you finally let it do the thing. Because I used to watch the monster truck rallies with my dad as a kid. Don't judge me. (laughs) (laughs) And so when it finally did the thing, the way that they're all running to get away from the truck, it makes it so much funnier than just having the destroyed two cars. You have four guys who are just like scrambling to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. I also love the line, even their truck is on steroids. (laughs) (laughs) I loved it. I thought the semi that they had in Think Big, I wish it had a little bit more character. And I was like, oh, this is perfect for them. This should be like in every one of their movies, including the Barbarians. That truck is officially the third brother. (laughs) I did have to laugh, though, because one of the two songs that we get from the Barbarian Brothers. Oh, we get four. There are four songs by the Barbarian Brothers and two others that they wrote, even though they didn't perform. (laughs) Okay. But one of them is I Ride My Harley, which is playing when they're coming back from the carnival. Mm -hmm. And... They're in a monster truck. That's not a Harley, but I kind of love it. It's so dumb. I'm just laughing. And I love the fact that that giant monster truck is filled with all these stuffed animals to the point where they're literally pouring off the side of the thing and getting trampled by the truck. I'm surprised we never got that date montage. Right? Yeah. I really expected like a montage of them trying to impress the teacher by winning prizes and they just keep one-upping each other. God, could you imagine like Barbarian Brothers in bumper cars, Barbarian Brothers doing skee ball? I mean, I want that cutscene, but <laughs> it's clearly not there. Yeah. It's fine. Bringing up the songs, there are seven songs that play throughout the movie. They wrote all of them. They performed four of them. The composer of this film, who also produced all the music and performed the other three, is Paul Sabu. Evie, do you remember the old movie actor Sabu, who was in, like, Arabian Nights and Jungle Book back in the 40s? I feel, like, vaguely out of my periphery, but not really, no. He was this very young Indian actor who came to America and, like, just suddenly became the lead in a whole bunch of movies for a very short time. Paul Sabu is his son, who is a composer and record producer. Oh, cool. Sadly, I could not find any actual clean tracks, but yeah, every single song in this movie, the Barbarian Brothers were involved with. Like, you even watch the end credits, it's like song after song after song, written and produced by Peter Paul, David Paul, and Paul Sabu. I think they were trying to break into a record contract, but they never got a record out of it. Yeah, that's a shame. I mean, they're not good songs, but I still want to own an album of their songs. And I think I sent both of you a music video that I found that they did for Barbarians. Yes. That's amazing. It was that. And then, of course, they did the opening song for Think Big. 
I'm kind of surprised that they never, like, how come we never got, like, the Barbarian Brothers and the Fat Boys doing something together? I don't know, but we need to make that happen. It's a little too late to make that happen. I need a time machine, Noel. Get me my time machine. Not all the Fat Boys have survived to this day, so I don't think we can do That's why we get a time machine, Noel. Did you not hear him? <laughs> time machine. <laughs> time machine. Well, and then I'm just trying to think of, J.D., is there anything else you can think of that you want to bring up? The actual, like, score is really, like, you mentioned, like, the weird 90s synth trumpet type thing. Type, yeah. Yeah. It's not good. It's not good. It's really wacky music playing during the playground shootout. That is a Pee Wee Herman style background noise when they're shooting around kids at a playground. I'm like, that wouldn't fly today. I do love the double jump that they do to save the mother and her baby. Yeah, that was actually a pretty impressive bit of stunt work. And I have to wonder how much of the stunts were just them, because how do you find people to double for the purpose? I wonder right? the, That's what I was wondering. Like, especially when they're hanging off the helicopter. That can't be them. There's not that many people who are <laughs> that big. You only see them from the back, so it's probably stunt people. I'm wondering if did they just like pad things up ridiculously. Maybe. Because but... even when they're like doing the big fight scene throughout the house, it's like a lot of that has to be the Barbarian Brothers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no way that they could have faked that. They are literally walking triangles, like inverted triangles. <laughs> Like, they are so broad-shouldered, you can't really mistake them for anyone else. I even love the bit where we actually get the montage at the gym, where it's basically like the Barbarian Brothers are like, hey, you want to throw some cameos to all of our buddies? I did think of the joke when the gym owner's like, Flo, I think is her name, mm -hmm. she like says like, oh, I'm going to give you two months free, which means you still owe me four months of your membership fees. And she walks away and one of them is like, I think she's got a deeper voice than me. Yeah. That's kind of mean spirited. I don't mind the giant seven foot bodybuilder who they make the joke of, yeah, I think you're taking too many hormones and he's got all the weird lumps on his face and has the high pitched voice. That one I didn't mind. Well, that's also somebody who's doing something to himself. Like, that seems like they're just picking on a woman for no particular reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part I didn't, yeah. The funny thing is we've had, I think, three movies now where they have made steroid jokes. And the Barbarian Brothers fully admit they were on steroids. <laughs> yeah, I'm not shocked. You don't look like that. I even love that the mother is like, look at their necks. Their necks are bigger than their heads. If you want to exercise something, why don't you exercise your brain? A brain isn't a muscle, Ma. It's an organ. <laughs> the parents still seem fascinated by the fact that they have twins. They're like 30, if not 40 years old. And they're like, they're one person and two bodies. Yeah, you didn't realize that like yeah. 30 plus years ago. <laughs> and then what's funny is in most of the previous films, Peter is the one who's slightly shorter and he smirks a lot more. He usually is the goofier character and David is more the straight man. And in this one, though, they kind of shook that up by having David be the one with the temper who's always flying off and doesn't understand what anyone's saying. Because he keeps trying to use big words, but he keeps using the wrong ones. You could have given us a coronation or something. <laughs> and then for some reason, someone gave Peter the directive of try to talk like Roddy Dangerfield. And so he's trying to deliver so many lines like this. You know, even with the Three Stooges shtick they add in, like you even get the Barbarian Brothers going like, ha, 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 you know, that kind of thing. I like that shtick. How dare you? I'm not criticizing it. It was just an interesting <laughs> addition. The Rodney Dangerfield thing, I think, was a little too much of trying to put a different style of shtick on the Barbarian Brothers when they already have a really nice shtick of their own. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I think they tried to play up the Italian thing. I didn't mind that so much because they brought in the chef angle and, you know, he was very much yeah. into the food. Yeah, I get why they kind of went for it, but I think they could have been as effective if they had just played it their normal selves. And it would have been a little less, okay, you're trying a little bit too hard with the, hey. 80% of this movie is still them doing their own stuff. So. Oh, yeah. It's weird. Like, they'll drop accents all the time. And sometimes it's just them being silly. And that's fine. I love them in the classroom, though. Oh, 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 me. Pick me. <laughs> <laughs> when she gives the dangling participle question to Davey, you get this almost kind of faux Jeopardy music. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I didn't realize they were Italian, though. That was pretty subtle. I don't know how you guys picked that one up. <laughs> I tried. Come on, you guys. I tried with the joke. I did not sleep much last night. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did like the scene where they go to a bank and as collateral, it's going to be like, here's all the great food we can make. That's not what collateral is. And then they start force feeding the bank loan guy. Yeah. Who, by the way, that's John Paragon, the director. <laughs> but then I love the character bit of, okay, so they get denied for the bank loan and get chased out by security. So they go to a park and start feeding the homeless. Yeah, I, I actually thought that was a nice little touch. Mm -hmm. Like they weren't doing it just out of like any other reason than other than, hey, we got all this extra food. We might as well feed some people. 
And I love especially help yourself to the cheesecake. So she literally dips her hand in and grabs a whole mm. handful of cheesecake. <laughs> and by the way, that one homeless woman who had the one line of, hey, this stuff's actually pretty good. That, again, is the actress who played Miss Yvonne on Pee-wee's Playhouse and had the cameo in Double Trouble, too. So she's a regular collaborator of John Paragon. Huh. Honestly, the first time I watched this film, for some reason, the shtick in the opening restaurant scene just didn't work for me. And even here, I think that one just doesn't quite play as well, aside from the Paul Bartel cameo, because I always love Paul Bartel. I don't know why, I just that one sequence still just doesn't work for me that well. It just falls flat. I like the brothers in that, but the problem is the whole gag with orders ready or whatever, you know, the guy getting upset because they're not picking up the order fast enough. And the guy being the most disgusting chef this side of Barf's Burgers. Yeah, it's just a little overdone. It doesn't really click with me. How is this a restaurant that's operating? (laughs) Yeah, this looks like a really fine dining restaurant, but the actual food looks like it should be in a Toxic Avenger film. It's what the bad guys should be dumping into the sewers. Yeah. The one bit that I did enjoy of how's the lasagna oh he seems to like it Got the weird guy. <laughs> i love the weird guy who's just like so happy and chewing just nomming <laughs> on that food yeah i mean i got a genuine smile when you see the brothers they keep coming up and asking like are you ready to order and then, no i already told you and then like you see the brothers together and one of them just slouched over his brother's shoulder i'm like they're just so charming i'm like oh yay mm-hmm. i am gonna watch another barbarians film i am excited And then I think that kind of brings us to some final thoughts. So, Evie, what do you think about the fact that this was the last Barbarian Brothers movie? I don't think I can express my rage about that in, like, (laughs) a way that is not me screaming for five minutes. I don't understand why. Like, these movies are fun. And you have people, I go into their freaking filmography, and they have, like, hundreds of movies. Like, why? Why do they have hundreds of movies? And there's only, like, four of these. Yeah. Makes no sense. I agree. Like, I had such a great time doing this retrospective with you, Noel. I'm sad that this isn't the end, but this is like the last of the films that we get to discuss. Obviously, I don't think we're ever going to get any more, but I really wish we could. I really wish that there's some way that we could get at least a couple more. Like, come on. I know part of it is they were choosing projects that almost all went straight to video, so they weren't really building a mainstream audience. There just wasn't enough demand for more. And part of it was also they were doing a lot of drugs and a lot of steroids, and they hit their breaking point. So you can understand them getting to a point just in their lives where they need to pull out and pull things together. And to their credit, they did. I think Peter came out of it a bit more on the angry, bitter end, especially if you see some of the streets. He literally goes in front of campuses, does performance art, and rants at people. David, though, seems to have really cleaned up well. He does music. He's a photographer. He's published books of photography. He works for his church. He seems to have come out in a really peaceful Zen type state. And I don't know that they would ever want to go back to that world because I get the sense that it burned them pretty bad. And that sucks. It really does suck. I wish there was a world where they could have gotten more success and maybe kept their noses clean or whatever they were doing. So we could have gotten more of these films because they're a delight. And I really am disappointed that this is the last one. I mean, that was the big thing was I expected going into this project that we would just be laughing at these two guys who are just these big, silly slabs of muscle. And actually, their size and their builds were not the parts that I really enjoyed in the movies. It was the characters, it was the personalities, it was the style of humor, the way they bounced off each other. It was them. And the thing is, you could have slimmed them down. You could have them nowadays. They they both still look fantastic. They're both a lot leaner, but they're still really well built, really well cut. They both still look exactly the same in terms of hair and their faces and everything. You don't need them to be gigantic slabs of muscle to still have the aspects that I really enjoyed watching. Honestly, The Barbarians was the only one where that really even factored in. Yeah. Because all the other films, even Think Big, it's not even about them being these gigantic muscle guys. No, they're just twin truck drivers who happen to be in the right place at the right time. Like their size really has, other than it makes you believe that they could do the fight stuff. Yeah. Which in the 90s, there was a big emphasis on either being a martial artist or being a big guy. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you could be anybody, Joe Schmo, and you can have an awesome fight scene. You could be a 66-year-old British Shakespearean actor and be one of the top grossing action stars of the modern. <laughs> exactly. 
it would have been nice if they'd at least kept doing stuff so we could, even if they wanted to clean up, they wanted to change their lifestyles, it would have still been kind of cool to see the transitional journey if they had kept making films along the way. Yeah. Hmm. But even then, I think part of it was is that they were starting to get really restrained in these very direct-to-video silly movies, and... I would have liked to have seen them in some interesting stuff. I, you, honestly, you could throw them in a Terry Gilliam movie. They probably would have had some fun characters and, and made some fun moments. Put them in a Tim Burton movie, it has some interesting stuff. And again, it's not just the visual of them. That's where I kind of feel bad about what I suggested for them with the Batman movies. I really like the way they play off each other. I like the little physical bits of business that they do. I like the charisma that they bring to the screen. They are genuinely talented performers. And again, that was the surprise of this journey is finding out, hey, they're human. Yeah. I can see why they caught on and I'm sad that they didn't stay. Agreed. And that's why we're getting our final thoughts out of the way before our final thoughts episode. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, this was only supposed to be a four episode podcast. We're doing a fifth episode just covering odds and ends just because we don't want to say goodbye yet. <laughs> no. And they were in five movies and we didn't really discuss DC Cab as part of this retrospective as that part was, of Shuma That's part of the series. This is a official spinoff of Shuma Cast, so that was part of the series. Yeah, well. We're not doing a second episode on DC Cab. Damn it. You were already on it. <laughs> <laughs> But we could invite Evie back. I could. I could watch DC Cab. I don't know what it's about. It's about cabs in DC. No. So Evie, thank you for joining us once again. Thank you for having me. And JD, thank you again for taking this journey with me. Bros to the end, my friend. Bros to the end. We didn't get enough high fives or like big like arm flex predator handshakes in these movies. <laughs> we only got that one great arm wrestling scene in Barbarians. Remember the one where he hisses at the snake? Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Our Brilliance is a part of Schumacast, which can be found at schumacast.blogspot.com and on Stitcher. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. The music in this episode is Stars by Jack Locke and is used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Barbarians and Schumacast are in no way affiliated with the creators and copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.